Jeremiah 35, verse 30. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have only done evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have only provoked me to anger with the work of their hands, saith the Lord. For the city has been to me as a provocation of mine anger and of my fury from the day that they built it even to this day, that I should remove it from before my face. Because of all the evil of the children of Israel and of the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, and the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they have turned unto me the back, and not the face. Though I taught them rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. But they set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to defile it. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind, that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. And now therefore thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, Whereof you say it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whether I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath. And I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. We have here God's answer to Jeremiah's prayer designed to quiet his mind and make him easy. And it is the full discovery of the purpose of God's wrath against the present generation and the purpose of of his grace concerning the future generations. Jeremiah knew not how to sing both of mercy and judgment, but God here teaches to sing unto him of both. When we know not how to reconcile one word of God with another, we may yet be sure that both are true. Both are pure. Both shall be made good, and not one iota or tittle of either shall fall to the ground. When Jeremiah was ordered to buy the field in Anathoth, he was willing to hope that God was about to revoke the sentence of his wrath and to order the Chaldeans to raise the siege. No, says God, the execution of the sentence shall go on. Jerusalem shall be laid in ruins. Note. Assurances of future mercy must not be interpreted as securities from present troubles. But lest Jeremiah should think that his being ordered to buy this field intimated that all the mercy of God had in store for his people after their return was only that they should have the possession of their own land again. He further informs him that that was but a type and figure of those spiritual blessings which should then be abundantly bestowed upon them. I speak will be more valuable than fields and vineyards. So that in this word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah, we have first as dreadful threatenings, and then as precious promises as perhaps any we have in the Old Testament, life and death, good and evil, are here set before us. Let us consider and choose wisely first. The ruin of Judah and Jerusalem is here pronounced. The decree has gone forth and shall not be recalled. God here asserts his own sovereignty and power. Verse 27. Behold, I am Jehovah, a self-existent, self-sufficient being. I am that I am. I am the God of all flesh, that is, of all mankind here called flesh, because weak and unable to contend with God. Psalm 56, verse 4. And because wicked and corrupt and unapt to comply with God, God is the creator of all and makes what use he pleases of all. He that is the God of Israel is the God of all flesh and of the spirits of all flesh. And if Israel were cast off, 
could raise up a people to his name out of some other nation. If he be the God of all flesh, he may well ask, Is anything too hard for me? What cannot he do, from whom all the powers of men are derived, on whom they depend, and by whom all their actions are directed and governed? Whatever he designs to do, whether in wrath or in mercy, nothing can hinder him nor defeat his designs. Number two, he abides by that he had often said of the destruction of Jerusalem by the king of Babylon, verse 28. I will give this city into his hand, now that he is grasping at it, and he shall take it and make a prey of it, verse 29. The Chaldeans shall come and set fire to it, shall burn it and all the houses in it, God's house not accepted, nor the king's, neither. Number three, he assigns a reason for these severe proceedings against the city that had been so much in his favor. It is sin. It is that and nothing else that ruins it. First, they were impudent and daring in sin. They offered incense to Baal, not in corners, as men ashamed or afraid of being discovered, but upon the tops of their houses, verse 29 in defiance of God's justice. Number two, they designed an affront to God in it. They did it to provoke me to anger, verse 29. They have only provoked me to anger with the works of their hands, verse 30. They could not promise themselves any pleasure, profit, or honor out of it, but did it on purpose to offend God. And again, verse 32, all the evil which they have done was to provoke me to anger. They knew he was a jealous God in the matters of his worship. And there they resolved to try his jealousy and dare him to his face. Jerusalem has been to me a provocation of my anger and fury, verse 31. Their conduct in everything was provoking. Number three. They began betimes and had continued all along provoking to God. They have done evil before me from their youth, ever since they were first formed into a people, verse 30. Witness their murmurings and rebellions in the wilderness. And as for Jerusalem, though it was the holy city, it has been a provocation to the holy God from the day that they built it even to this day, verse 31. Oh, what reason have we to lament the little honor God has from this world and the great dishonor that has done him when even in Judah, where he is known and his name is great, and in Salem, where his tabernacle is, there was always that found that was a provocation to him. Number four, the orders and decrees of men contributed to the common guilt and therefore were justly involved in the common ruin. Not only the children of Israel that had revolted from the temple, but the children of Judah too. They still adhered to it. Not only the common people, the men of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, but those that should have reproved and restrained sin in others were themselves ringleaders in it, their kings and princes their priests and prophets. Number five, God had again and again called them to repentance, but they turned a deaf ear to his calls and rudely turned their back on him that called them, though he was their master, to whom they were bound in duty and their benefactor, to whom they were bound in gratitude and interest. Verse 33, I taught them better manners, with as much care as ever any tender parent taught a child, rising up early in teaching them, studying to adapt the teaching to their capacities, taking them be times when they might have been most pliable, but all in vain. They turn not the face to me, would not so much as look upon me, nay, they turned the back upon me, an expression of the highest contempt as he called them, like froward children, so they went 
from him, Hosea 11.2. They have not hearkened to receive instruction. They regarded not a word that was said to them, though it was designed for their own good. Number six. There was in their idolatries an impious contempt of God, verse 34. They set their abominations, their idols, which they knew to be in the highest degree abominable to God, in a house which is called by my name to defile it. They had their idols not only in their high places and groves, but even in God's temple. Number seven. They were guilty of the most unnatural cruelty to their own children, for they sacrificed them to Moloch, verse 35. Thus, because they liked not to retain God in their knowledge, but changed his glory into shame, they were justly given up to vile affections and stripped of natural ones, and their glory was turned into shame. And eight... What was the consequence of all this? First, they caused Judah to sin. The whole country was infected with the contagious idolatries and iniquities of Jerusalem. Next, they brought ruin upon themselves. It was as if they had done it on purpose that God should remove them from before his face. Verse 31, they would throw themselves out of his favor. Number two, the restoration of Judah and Jerusalem is here promised, verse 36, and so on. God will in judgment remember mercy, and there will a time come, a set time to favor Zion. Observe first the despair to which this people were now at length brought. When the judgment was threatened at a distance, they had no fear. When it attacked them, they had no hope. They said concerning the city, verse 36, It shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, not by any cowardice or ill conduct of ours, but by the sword, famine, and pestilence. Concerning the country, they said with vexation, It is desolate, without man or beast. There is no relief. There is no remedy. It is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Note. Deep security commonly ends in deep despair, whereas those that keep up a holy fear at all times have a good hope to support them in the worst of times. Number two, the hope that God gives them of mercy, which he had in store for them hereafter. Though their carcasses must fall in captivity, yet their children after them shall again see this good land and the goodness of God in it. They shall be brought up from their captivity and shall come and settle again in this land. Verse 37. They had been under God's anger and fury and great wrath, but now they shall partake of his grace and love and great favor. He had dispersed them and driven them into all countries. Those that fled dispersed themselves. Those that fell into the enemy's hands were dispersed by them in policy, to prevent combinations among them. God's hand was in both. But now God will find them out and gather them out of all the countries where they were driven, as he had promised in the law, Deuteronomy 30, verses 3 and 4. And the saints had prayed, Psalm 106, 47, Nehemiah 1, verse 9. He had banished them, but he will bring them again to this place which they could not but have an affection for. For many years past, while they were in their own land, they were continually exposed and terrified with the alarms of war. But now I will cause them to dwell safely, being reformed and having returned to God, neither their own consciences within, nor their enemies without shall be a terror to them. He promises, verse 41, I will plant them in this land assuredly. Not only I will certainly do it, but they shall here enjoy a holy security and repose, and they shall take root here, shall be planted in stability, and not again be unfixed and shaken. Secondly, God will renew his covenant with them, a covenant of grace, 
the blessings of which are spiritual, and such as will work good things in them, to qualify them for the great things God intended to do for them. It is called an everlasting covenant, verse 40. Not only because God will be forever faithful to it, but because the consequences of it will be everlasting. For doubtless here the promises look further than to Israel according to the flesh, and are sure to all believers, to every Israelite indeed. Good Christians may apply them to themselves and plead them with God, may claim the benefit of them and take the comfort of them. God will own them for his and make over himself to them to be theirs. They shall be my people. He will make them his by working in them all the characters and dispositions of his people. And then he will protect and guide and govern them as his people. And to make them truly, completely, and eternally happy, I will be their God. They shall serve and worship God as theirs and cleave to him only. And he will approve himself theirs. All he is, all he has, shall be engaged and employed for their good. Secondly, God will give them a heart to fear him, verse 39. That which he requires of those whom he takes into covenant with him as his people is that they fear him, that they reverence his majesty, dread his wrath, stand in awe of his authority, pay homage to him, and give him the glory due to his name. Now what God requires of them, he here promises to work in them, pursuant to his choice of them as his people. Note, as it is God's prerogative to fashion men's hearts, so it is his promise to his people to fashion theirs aright, and a heart to fear God is indeed a good heart and well-fashioned. It is repeated, verse 40, I will put my fear in their hearts, that is, work in them gracious principles and dispositions that shall influence and govern our whole conversations. Teachers may put good things into our heads, but it is God only that can put them into our hearts, that can work in us both to will and to do. Number three, he will give them one heart and one way, in order that they are walking in one way. He will give them one heart as the heart is, so will the way be, and both shall be one. That is, first they shall be, each of them, one with themselves. One heart is the same with a new heart, Ezekiel 11, 19. The heart is in one when it is fully determined for God and entirely devoted to God. 